Well, hello, Faith Church, and whoever else may be watching. Uh, we're so glad that uh, you were able to join us. Just a bit of a, a reminder, if you are listening, we would really appreciate it if you would subscribe to our channel or uh, as you're getting on through Facebook, that you would uh, share this. It would help us to give this out to a, a broader audience. Um, God has opened up a different venue or a, a, another venue during this time of, of YouTube, and so we just are going to continue to be faithful. Um, we were so glad to be able to resume services, although in a bit of a different way, uh, last week at 9.30 or 11 o'clock. It was so good to see a number of your faces. But until we kind of start to trickle in, you know, a little more, we're going to continue to do this whole YouTube thing. And I'm going to continue to remind you of different ways that you can connect. Obviously, through Facebook and YouTube, and kind of the keyword is Faith Church Martinsville, as well as our website, www.myfaithchurch.org, or any questions that you may have, email the church at info at myfaithchurch.org. And again, that's a way to connect, but here's a way to contribute. A number of you have been doing this, and we just thank you so much for your continued generosity. Go on our website uh, and click the donate button, or you can also text to 73256. It allows us to be generous as you are generous as well. And so we are opening up again uh, chapter 3 in the book of First Samuel. We've been on this um, series that we're calling New or Renewed Hope. Um, we've been walking through the book of First Samuel. I think we're on our fourth week now. Um, First Samuel begins really out of this horrible time of a 400-year downward slide spiritual deterioration that we see in the book of Judges, where the theme was everyone just did what was right in their own eyes. And the last two horrible stories of the book of Judges, there's just corruption. There's corruption in families. There's corruption in the priesthood. There's corruption in the nation of Israel as well. And yet what we see that out of this time, chapter 1, God begins to restore hope. And he begins with a family. He begins with a woman by the name of Hannah who was barren for about two decades. She makes a vow to the Lord that if, she, if he is willing to bless her with a child, that she would give the child back to the Lord. The Lord blesses her. She gives birth to Samuel. She gives him back to the Lord. She finds joy living in the Lord's promise even before the Lord's promise is fulfilled. We see God restoring hope to a family that was a mess. Well, this morning we're going to see God call Samuel. Samuel is this boy that was given to the Lord. God is about to restore hope to his house by cleaning house. Now, if you were here and able to join us last week, uh, God has just pronounced major judgment on the household of Eli and his wicked sons that he calls scoundrels. They were robbing God's house. They were robbing God's people. They were sleeping with the female attendants of the Lord's house. They were doing everything the opposite of what they should do. And a prophet comes in and tells Eli there's going to be judgment. God is restoring hope in his house by cleaning house. Now this morning, or this afternoon, whenever you may be watching this, we're going to open up and just look at 10 verses in chapter 3. Very familiar or, or perhaps even a, a famous you know, passage of scripture where God speaks and the little boy Samuel, who's probably 10, 11, 12 years old at the time, he hears the Lord's voice. Eventually Samuel is going to become the high priest, right? God is restoring hope in his house. Eli is out. Hophni and Phinehas, those two wicked sons, they're out. Samuel is going to be the new spiritual leader of God's people. We're actually going to see his lineage go through through the, through the time of, of, of Jesus. But I want to read the passage of Scripture. If you have your Bible, turn to chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. Here's what the Scripture says. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. Notice what the author of 1 Samuel is doing here. He is setting up the scene, right? The word of the Lord was rare. This is the time of the judges, a dark time. There were not many visions. And the reason why is because people aren't living right. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak, he had more of a problem than just physical blindness. There was spiritual blindness of his own house going on. That he could barely see he was lying down in his usual place. It's been his house out, kind of outside of the tabernacle. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. This is the menorah during times of festivals and sacrifices. They would keep this lamp burning. And it was Samuel's job. It was probably actually Eli's job or Eli's son's job. But they were gone, right? They were scoundrels. So it fell on Samuel. He was already doing really the job of the priest. 
It was his job to keep this lamp burning during this time. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Now, we don't have time to talk about the ark of the covenant. This is where God's presence dwells. He said this in the Old Testament, I will, I will be on the mercy seat. My presence will be there. It was a visual representation of the invisible God. It was a teaching tool to God's people of how to handle God's presence in their life. When they handled God's presence correctly, it was blessing. When they did not handle God's presence correctly, it became uh, judgment in their life. Then the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli. He didn't know it was the Lord's voice, right? He ran to Eli, and he said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lied down. And again, the Lord called Samuel. And the Lord got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said. I mean, here's a boy that's getting up out of bed. You probably experienced this if you have kids. I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. We're going to talk about this important verse, verse 7, in just a moment. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you again, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. A very important part of the story. So Samuel went and lied down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling at, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. Now next week we're going to look at what he said, but this week we're going to look at the calling of Samuel. Now here's kind of our key question. How do we hear from God? This is a famous passage of scripture and there's a lot of good stuff and we're going to get to it in a moment, but it really begs the question, Samuel heard from the Lord during these dark times, right? So how do we hear from the Lord? Now, obviously, one way is we hear from the Lord from his word. In fact, you know, one of the reasons why I, I just relish the, the, the fact that I get to be a pastor is because there have been times in my life, whether opening up the word of my own or hearing it expounded or, uh, you know, a sermon or for somebody else or, or, or reading, you know, a commentary or a book that... God's word has just jumped out from the page and has just spoken directly, you know, into my life. There have been times when I've heard many of you, you know, after a Sunday morning where you kind of come up to me with tears in your eyes and you say, how did you know? And I say, I have no idea what you're talking about. And you said something that spoke right, you know, you, you picked this, you knew what was going on, you, you picked this passage of scripture and I said, no, I didn't. And then sometimes it's not even what I was thinking, you know, it's just God's word God's word just being potent, you know. Scripture says of itself that it's sharper than any double-edged sword. And it speaks, you know, into our life and divides into joy and marrow. You know, and there's sometimes, I, don't, I can't even take credit for it, you know, because the Lord is sometimes just speaking in different ways, right? You've all experienced, I hope you've experienced that. God's word just speaking into your life. Now, I've never heard the audible, you know, voice of the Lord. I have at times heard, I believe, little promptings, you know, from the Lord. And sometimes, I'll be honest, I got it wrong, you know. There have been times I thought the Lord was speaking to go in a particular direction or make a particular decision. And then as kind of things started to unfold, I realized that that was really more Matt than, than the Lord. And I was trying to make something of the Lord that was really originating, you know, with me. There have been other times, though, uh, when I felt like I heard, you know, from the Lord and became evident very quickly that the Lord was, you know, in this and, and then there have been other times when I, I, I believe I heard from the Lord and I had a particular outcome in mind of what was going to confirm this, and yet God had a, had a different plan. You know. I'll just give you a quick example of that. When, when, when Tammy and I, several years ago, we were starting to explore adoption, we believed that it was God's desire for us to adopt from China. And so we actually picked an organization that specialized in overseas adoption. And we're, we were beginning that process, and then there was someone who came off really off the street and said, I've been, I, I, I'm pregnant, and I, I, I want to give my, my child up for, a, for adoption, and, and I just kind of felt kind of called to this agency. And through just a set of circumstances, Cameron kind of came into our life, and it wasn't the outcome that we expected, but as things unfolded, God's plan was just revealed. He got us to that position, even though the outcome in our mind was going to be different. Now, he was there. 
Now, whether it's God working through these promptings, and sometimes we get it wrong, and, or whether it's God opening up his word, he's never going to contradict himself. He's not going to tell you to do something that is sin. But obviously, when we open up God's word, we hear from his voice, or we, we sense from maybe from his spirit, or from other people speaking truth into our life, I think the key thing to remember, as we see all over this passage of scripture, is humility. And we see through this passage of scripture that Samuel, even though he he didn't know it was the Lord speaking on three separate occasions. There was this spirit of humility. And also there was a spirit of humility even with, with Eli. You know, the Lord was cleaning house and Eli was going to be out and his sons were going to be out. But still there was this, the Lord speaking. You say this to the Lord, speak. Your servant you know, is listening. Well, we're going to jump into this passage of scripture because I believe it does give us some tremendous insights of what it means to hear from the Lord. Here's number one. Position yourself close to the light and not the darkness. One of the reasons why I believe that Samuel heard very clearly the voice of the Lord, even though he did not know it was the Lord speaking, he was in the right place, he was at the right time, and he was doing the right thing. He was in the house of the Lord. Let's look what the scripture says so I can show this to you. Oops, I went too far. Let's go back. Now the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions, because people weren't living correctly. It wasn't that the Lord didn't want to speak, because the people weren't really interested. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, there's a double meaning here, was lying down in his usual place, apart from the house of the Lord, the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord. He was positioning himself between the doors of the tabernacle and the curtain that separated the presence of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant. He was not allowed to go behind there. Only the high priest could go behind there, and once a year on the Day of Atonement, right? But he was as close as he could be, doing what he was supposed to do, that if the Lord spoke, he was in the perfect position. This is called what we would call probably sacred space. Outside there was darkness. You know, in the New Testament, we were called, Jesus tells his disciples, to, to be in the world, but not of the world. We live in a dark place. You know, in the time of Eli, it was a dark place. The word of God was rare. Visions were not you know, readily you know, given to people. It was a dark time, right? We can kind of relate to that. There is darkness that is out there. And so we position ourselves, creating sacred space in our life with time to hear from the Lord. How are you doing with that? Are there times during your day where you say, and you open up the Lord's word, one of the reasons why I lead you to our, you know, our website is that there are so many resources out there. You can download um, our Right Now Media app. It's this Netflix of Bible studies. You can get the, the Bible app U version, and there's all kinds of devotionals. You can get online, and there's all kinds of different helps and devotions and studies that you can do on your own. I can lead you, I can lead you, like you can lead a horse to water, right? But unless that desire is in your life to create sacred space, one of the reasons why Samuel heard the voice of the Lord, he was in the right place at the right time, and he was doing the right thing, right? Are there areas in your life, why would God speak to you, right? If there are areas in your life like Hophi and Phineas, where you're just kind of doing whatever you want to do, you're in disobedience to the Lord, why would the Lord reveal to you his specific will for your life when you're not following his general will? I mean, this kind of makes sense, right? Samuel was ministering before the Lord, doing the right things. He was living, yes, in dark times, but he was as close to the light as he possibly could be. Now, here's kind of our application for this. Are you creating sacred space in your life? Are you allowing the world's darkness, are you resembling that in your life? Are you doing the things that you know you should not do and yet still asking the Lord to speak into your life? Why would God do that? If he's already spoken in your word and you know what it says and you're doing contrary to that, why in the world would God then speak truth into your life when you're not even following the truth that he's already given you, right? 
And so are you creating sacred space, though, in your life? If you're not disobedient to the Lord, are you opening up his word? Are you putting on a worship CD? Are you downloading the, the Bible app that we lead you to on our website or right down media? Are you doing the things intentionally, as we see Samuel doing intentionally, keeping the lamp burning, placing himself in the right space? You know, great opportunities, you know, often comes from people who are in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. Samuel, no different. He was in the right place at the right time and he was doing the right thing. How are you doing creating in your life sacred space or are you outside of the tabernacle doors living in the darkness? Right. Here's number two. Number two is this. Tune your eyes and ears to determine who is calling. Very interesting verse I want to lead you to. Verse six, again, the Lord calls Samuel. This is the third time. He had heard the voice. He didn't think it was God. He thought it was Eli. Samuel gets up and he goes to Eli and he says, Here I am, you called me. My son Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Verse 7, interesting verse. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Well, what are you talking about? We have just read verse 1 through 6, three different times, the voice of the Lord said, Samuel, Samuel. What do you mean the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him? Well, that's the voice of the Lord. The word of the Lord is something quite different. This is what we call in the Old Testament a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. Sometimes Jesus is referred to in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. We see this in Daniel. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to bow down. They were thrown into the, the fiery furnace. And King Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace and says, I see four individuals, right? One who looks like the angel of the Lord. You know, we see in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the, the word for God, the Hebrew word Elohim. It's a plural name of God. All members of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, the Spirit, the hovered over the waters of the deep. All three members of the Trinity are present in Genesis chapter 1. We are given further insight to this in the Gospel of John chapter 1. In the beginning, starts out just like Genesis, doesn't it? Was the Word, and the Word was God. God was with God, the Word was with God in the beginning. Jesus has always been there throughout all of the Old Testament. And here it is. The word, this is referring to Jesus. Now what's going on here? Before Samuel understood the voice of the Lord, this is the gospel, what this is. He needed to accept the invitation from the person of the Lord. Don't get this backwards in your life. So many times, I think we desire to hear the voice of the Lord to determine what direction we might want to go and not really interested in the relationship of the Lord. Isn't it interesting this passage of scripture? Three times he heard the voice, did not know it was the Lord, thought it was Eli. Not until the word of the Lord, Jesus' presence came, then he was able to determine, ah, this is God speaking. Now, if I didn't convince you that the word of the Lord is Jesus, look what the passage of scripture says as we continue to read. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized, the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And he calls you again, say, speak, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lied down in his place. Verse 10, the Lord came and stood there. How does a voice stand? This is Jesus in the Old Testament. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at, at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then the Lord said, speak, for your servant is listening. What I believe this means for us is this. God is far more concerned about establishing a relationship with you. He is far more concerned about the condition of your soul than some of the things that you perhaps are concerned with when it comes to hearing God's voice. We want to hear God's voice because is this job where I should go or is this job you know, where I should go? What school should I attend? What car should I buy? It's not that God's not interested in those things, but if those are the only reasons why we want to hear God's voice so we can get a little bit of insight, so we can feel like we're in a little bit more control and not establish a relationship of who's the Lord of our life, we've really missed the point. 
God's will is not something to be sought after so we can feel better about what direction our life is headed. God is far more concerned about establishing a relationship with Samuel. And until the relationship was established, the word of the Lord came, the Lord came and stood, then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Don't get the cart before the horse. Don't determine, I wanna hear God's voice so that I can know what to do or what direction my life is going before you neglect the invitation and the acceptance of that invitation of salvation. Establishing that relationship, God is far more concerned about establishing a relationship with you than perhaps sometimes we are. We just want to hear his voice, right? So we can feel a little more control of our life. That's not what is going on here. Here's observation number three. Surrender your response before you decipher God's voice. The idea here that's being displayed is before the Lord even spoke, Eli said to Samuel, you better surrender obedience. Do not determine after whether or not you're going to be obedient after you hear what God says. We're going to actually figure this out next week. That was a good thing, right? So many times we want to hear God's voice and then we want to offer maybe alternate plan B. Maybe we want to alter the plan a little bit. No, that's not what it is. Let's look at the scripture. It's something very important I want you to point, I want to point out here. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you again, say, Speak, the Lord, your servant, is listening. What is being said here is this Hebrew concept called Shuma. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, there's this very famous saying, and if you're a Jewish uh, person, you repeat this. Hear, O Israel, for the Lord your God is one. And the reason why in Deuteronomy we see this is because God's people had come from Egypt. As a polytheistic culture, they worshiped, poly means many, they worshiped many gods. And in the gods that they worshiped, they shaped them, they formed them, they created them out of stone, wood, or whatever, so they could get their gods to do their bidding. That's one of the reasons why Moses was given the command You know, one of the Ten Commandments is do not make any graven image. Do not shape or form your God out of uh, gold or wood. Why? Because the concept is this. You do not form and shape and create God in your image, what you think he needs to be, in order for him to do what you think that he needs to do. That's what the Egyptians do. And through the plagues, God took out every single one of those gods with the Ten Plagues. God is saying, you are different. Hear, O Israel, Shema, the Lord your God is one. God calls the shot. So when he says, before he even determines what he, before you even hear, you surrender obedience. We actually see this here, don't we? So Samuel went and lied down in this place. The Lord came and said there, stood there and said, calling as he did another time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. It's, it's Shema. What basically Samuel is saying through the advice of Levi, before you even speak, I want you to know that I'm going to do whatever it is you tell me to do. I'm going to implement in my life. I'm not going to come back at you with, hey, let's tweak this plan a little bit. I'm not going to then determine after I hear that I'll obey after I, you know, if, if I agree. You know, there's a great verse in the scripture that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You cannot see that the Lord is good until you first taste, right? The idea here, Deuteronomy chapter 6, Shuma, before you even speak, I have determined because of who you are, you call the shots. So know this, speak the Lord, speak Lord, your servant is listening. Whatever you say, I'm going to do because of who you are. Here's our takeaway Very simple. What if this whole week, right? Before we start our day, we say to the Lord, speak. The Lord is listening. We create sacred space. We understand that we are living in a dark world, so we're gonna position ourselves in the right place at the right time to do the right thing. We're gonna rid ourselves of anything that would keep us from God so we can hear his voice clearly. We're going to get into his word because God has spoken already in his word. And then we're going to listen for the promptings of the Lord with a humble spirit. 
We're going to say to the Lord, right, speak, Lord, before you even say, understand, I'm going to do whatever it is you want me to do. And understand as well, it is about an invitation. It's not just about hearing the voice of the Lord so that you can feel control of your life. It is about this relationship. God is so concerned with your soul. What if this whole week we put into practice what we see Samuel placing, putting into practice in his life, where he says, speak, your servant is listening. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you strength. God bless you.